else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life are ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he can never be forgotten. Throughout heaven's eternal days On the mount of crucifixion Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Flowed a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in and from above and heaven's peace and perfect justice kiss the guilty world in love of thy fullness you are pouring thy great love on me anew without measure full and boundless drawing out my heart to you you alone will be my glory nothing in this world i see you have cleansed and sanctified me you alone have set me free well, good afternoon i hope y'all had a wonderful afternoon had a good nap glad you could make it back hope you had something good to eat and we're glad to see you uh, it's a penrod uh, trio still in the building or did Elvis leave the building? There's one of you. There's two of you who's missing. All right. After the men's prayer, y'all going to sing you special again. Guys, make sure you get the mics all working. So, right? Obey the pastor. <laughs> okay. Let's have the men come forward. We'll have a word of prayer. And ladies, if you'll have a seat, thank you so very much. You don't have to sing if y'all don't want Todd's playing. So I guess Todd's praying and Chuck's praying. So Todd, if you'll go first, please. through the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood. We thank you for the privilege of prayer, Lord, that as we bring our prayer requests before you, we know that you hear us, and that you answer us according to your will. And Lord, we have many that have burdens and, and requests that uh, we've mentioned already here in the services. And we pray that, Lord, you, you would answer those according to your will and your power. And Lord, you work in our lives and teach us, Lord, how much we need you in prayer and how much we ought to reach everything that we do, giving uh, honor and thanks to you. I just thank you for provision, Lord, and all that uh, it stands for, what you're doing here, working in our lives and raising up missionaries, uh, Lord, to send out to the field to preach the gospel, and for those that uh, serve here, Lord, to help minister to us and encourage us, we thank you for that. And we pray for our missionaries, Lord, we pray, continue to pray your hand upon them, and ask that you bless them and open doors for them to preach the gospel and, and to raise up others in their midst that would be able to continue to carry the gospel out and, and teach others to make disciples. And may your will be done there and that you put a hedge of protection around each and every one of them. Thank you for our pastors and the leadership here. And we pray that you bless them, fill them with your spirit every day, Lord, as they minister, uh, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, um, to be able to bring glory and honor to you and to be used greatly carry out your will. We look to thee and we ask, Father, all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we just come to you tonight. Lord, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness. Thank you for vision, how you've blessed this church. Thank you for Austin. Thank you for Robert, Trent. God, thank you for using them in such a special way. Pray for the missionaries on the field. And Lord, help us uh, to remember the message this morning, to be straightway. Lord, uh, to go without hesitation, to have a compassion and want to go and serve you and tell people about Christ. And uh, we just thank you for our salvation today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, let's all stand together and shake hands with each other. Make sure everybody is uh, welcome today. Thank you very much. You can make your way back to your seat. Now, this is the old man talking, so here comes an old man thing for you. First off, my deacons moved because Brother Morgan moved them, my young deacons, and he brought them over here. But this morning, they were not over Now I've got three ladies over here in y'all's place, boys. You don't man up and take your spot. Somebody else will take it. And then I was watching uh, Little Miss Canfield, Little Miss Elrod in the song. They were singing the words. That just blessed an old man's heart. Because that means they're learning, somebody's teaching them, and that's a, what a blessing. And uh, then this morning, uh, I don't know if you realize it, but uh, we have kids, little kids, learning to love Jesus, sing for him, and honor him, and I just, uh, I like that. So we're breaking the schedule just because I get to do that. I told him in my Sunday school class I had permission to go past 1010 this morning, and Miss Martha won't know about me getting permission. But anyway, so we're going to have uh, Miss Kelly Kenfield, where is Miss Kelly? So you could come be ready, uh, and uh, Justice, you can give her an arm up when it comes time. Thank you. But you can just have a seat on the front row if you want. Uh, and then uh, after this song here, Miss Kelly, you come on and, and uh, preach for us. Miss Kelly's going to give a word of testimony.
So I was asked um, for this afternoon service just to give a testimony of um, what the Lord has been doing in my heart over the last uh, few months and years. Um, and just to kind of, we've had a lot of people come to the church now that might not be familiar with what the Lord has been doing in my life in the last few years um, with, with my illness. So Trent asked me if I could even give a little bit of a description about what actually happens with this illness. Um, about six years ago, I started feeling some really debilitating symptoms, difficulty walking, climbing stairs, breathing, um, using my arms. Um, and through um, a series of things that only God could arrange, uh, we found out that I have a, a form of muscular dystrophy called Pompeii disease. And so without trying to make it sound super technical, so what happens in our bodies, we um, take gl glucose and our body converts it to glycogen. And that kind of acts like the gasoline for our bodies. Um, that's what kind of, that's what fuels us. And um, so my disease is a glycogen storage disease, which means that in our cells, whatever glycogen we don't use, the cells in your body dumps that into the lysosome, which kind of acts like the big trash can for your body. And then so when, when, when the trash gets dumped into the trash bag, then your nucleus in your cells send out a, an enzyme of whatever. Your body has all different kinds of enzymes. Well, there's a particular enzyme that's made to break down the glycogen and to, to get rid of it out of the body. I don't make enough of that enzyme. So as I'm packing glycogen into the lysosome, into the trash bag, it's not, I'm not sending enough stuff to break all that down. And so what happens is that trash bag just gets more and more full. And I'm sure you guys have had, especially if you men take out the trash, your, your wives, I've done this to Robert before, you packed a trash bag too full and you go to take the trash bag out and the trash bag splits. Well, that's what happens in the cells in my body, particularly the cells in my upper legs and arms and my hips and chest and neck muscles and my breathing muscles. And so what happens when that cell splits, it spills its contents into the muscle and it kills the muscle. And then as the muscle dies, it just kind of disintegrates into fat and connective tissue. And so obviously it's not a muscle anymore at that point. Um, ramifications behind that is that ultimately as the disease progresses, I would ultimately use, lose the use of legs and arms and then obviously breathing difficulties, um, using the, losing the use of, of my respiratory muscles as well. Um, it's, it's a pretty scary disease to think about it, and it's, and it's, it's pretty random. It, it's different in each person, it seems. It has, I mean, it has this basic footprint, but then it's also, it acts differently, and uh, you, it can progress much more quickly than you would anticipate it to. But praise the Lord, um, they've had, they had, there's a treatment available where I actually get a synthetic version of that enzyme, and so it comes in and it clears out the extra glycogen that I can't, that I can't clear out, so it kind of prolongs the progression of the disease. Um, so that's, that's a very, very good, very, very grateful for the, the opportunity to live in a, in a time period where, where that happens, where I can have that tr access to treatment. Um, and there's some really great things on the horizon, too. They're, they've been able to see effective use of a gene therapy in mice, and they'll start human trials in April. So I, I'm really, I, I mean, I would be first in line if the Lord would allow that to happen. So. I'm pretty excited about that opportunity. That's a potential cure. What they found in the mice is when they put the, the, um, the code for the, for the enzyme production, they'll insert it into the livers of the mice. The livers pick it up, and then they start producing that enzyme on its own. And so then I wouldn't have to have a, an infusion to get that replacement enzyme. My liver could actually produce that enzyme, which is, would be phenomenal. It could potentially be a cure. So that's that's very, very exciting news on the horizon. So I appreciate your prayers as far as that goes. Um, but the technical stuff is not really the important stuff. The important stuff is how God has been working in my heart through all of this and in my life and in the life of my family and my children and, and honestly, even through each of you in this illness. Um, I really just cannot thank you all enough. You all, I mean, you all have walked with me through this illness and I, the words just really cannot express how grateful I am from the prayers and the friendships and the phone calls and helping me with my children and helping me carry things, even though I know I'm stubborn and I tell you I can do it myself and I can still climb those stairs. I do need to try. I do need to push myself, just so you know. But I'm grateful for the times that you all have stepped in and helped me 
God, the little anonymous, thank you, thank you, the little anonymous things that you do that you won't tell me about, that it's you that's done it, so I can't say thank you properly. If you've done something like that, I'm, I, can, I, can, I really cannot tell you how grateful that I am for all of, through all of that. Um, but even more than that, just what the Lord is doing in my heart. He's just, he's done a wonderful thing. He's, even in the difficult times, I tell you, he's, he has carried us and he's walked with us through it. Um, he has been so good to us uh, through all of this. As um, I, I didn't really know how to verbalize it until just a little while ago, but um, obviously I carried on through all of this and I've trusted in the Lord, but um, something I've really realized that I've struggled with over the last few years would be that I, I kind of feel like I went through, I don't know really know how to word it out except for a period of, of grief or mourning in my life. Um, and the Lord has recently actually just brought me out of it. So it's, it's, it was great timing for me to be asked to share this with you. Um, I had all these hopes and dreams and desires of what I would, of who I would be for God and what I could do, do for God. And, um, and obviously this illness uh, closed some doors for, for those things that, those, those things I thought I could be or do for the Lord. And so when I had that, when, when, when we got this diagnosis and we realized that there were some things that, that uh, some doors that were closed, uh, you know, there was a period of grief. I, I don't want to sound morbid, um, but I, there was, in essence, really, I felt like a part, that part of me, of everything I thought I could be and do, did die. Um, with that diagnosis, and so there was a lot of grief and mourning that I that I had to work through, and I didn't I didn't know how to verbalize it. I didn't know how to say that's what it was until now that I feel like the Lord has really kind of brought me out of that. Um, but He's been so good. I mean, when when a, when certain dreams that you have die, He gives you even bigger and better ones. He's so good to us. He really is. Um, it's the verses that the Lord has really used in my life recently. Um, even in the dark days, this is not, I, I really don't want you to, to think that like I just walk around discouraged and depressed. Even on those depressing and discouraging days, this is really a victory march. He's told us that we are more than conquerors. And so I really have, if you, I've really relied recently on Romans 8, especially verse 35 when he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? shall, sorry, I just got a phone call, I apologize. <laughs> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Then he goes on and he says in verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved him. And he's teaching me that right now, that this is a victory march. It doesn't matter. I mean, even in those periods of mourning for me and the periods of grief and the periods I felt like I was walking around in a wilderness, I was still, I am still more than conquerors, and nothing's going to separate me from the love that he has and the purpose he has for my life. Um, he's such a good God. He really is. Thank you.
to have a word of prayer for Kelly and we have other people in our church that also have problems and uh, dealing with health issues and uh, Trent has organized this service this afternoon and so Kelly told you about hurting and then they sang a song even if the healing doesn't come and we got to love God and trust God and I thank you for loving Kelly and Robert and the kids and uh, we're going to have a special word of prayer for them so who am I going to get to lead us in prayer there uh Daniel, you can come up here. Daniel Cooper, you can come lead us in prayer for Robert and ask God to bless him. Daniel uh, was led to cross by Robert, so pray for Kelly, please. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father God, thank you for everything that the Camfield family has done for Vision Baptist Church. Thank you for always being with them through difficult times. Thank you for being such a gracious and merciful God. I ask that you help Kelly as she continues to deal with this disease, that you continue to be the comforter that we know you are that you continue to help that family as they grow in you and they love you, and you always are faithful. And I ask that you continue to help them and aid them. In your son's name I do pray. Amen. It ought to be that when we come to church, we are among family, and we can be open and share our heartaches and share uh, what, where we're hurting. And so I hope that you will pray for all the different people that are having issues and have needs and always be praying and asking God to work in their lives. Next, we're going to have Trent Cornwell. He's going to share a word of testimony with you. I don't know of a finer man anybody could work with, and so I'm honored he's here, and I hope you'll really pay attention. Thank you, Pastor. You know, I was told as a kid, and you probably heard it as well, if you want to go on a trip, uh, read a book. And so I read a lot of books because I wanted to go on a lot of trips. It takes you to a different place and escape uh, reality. A good song will do the same thing for you. It's a song's only as powerful as the truth that it tells and in the places that it can take you. And when we hear a song like we just heard, my wife and I often think about what we've learned about God's goodness because of the life of Kelly Canfield and what happened. I'm so glad that Pastor Ed Daniel um, pray as um, God has um, used the Canfield family to see him come of uh, the Christ. Somebody else is going to give a testimony of the day for this next song, Come to the Altar, which is going to be sung I really love this song, and I hope the person that isn't given the testimony will in the future. You'll enjoy that testimony. But this uh, song takes me to a place, and I'm sure it will take you to a place in your spiritual life as well when God maybe did this for you. Pastor said as a church family, uh, we should be loving and sharing. And um, there is no reason just for us to be emotional for no reason, but uh, Miss Kelly carries that with her all the time. And so it's good for us to, to step into her life for a little bit and to re be reminded of that. But when I was uh, 16 years old, I felt a real disconnect from my dad because of um, the life he had chosen to live was different than the one I wanted to live as a child of God. And I took a little time to try to mimic the life he was living, thinking that if I lived um, in sin that I would feel closer to him. Well, um, one weekend he asked me if on a Sunday he asked me if I would take him for a drive uh, to the nearest town. We're from a dry county. I don't know if any of y'all know what that is. We didn't sell alcohol where I'm from, but somehow there's a ton of it there. And, uh, and so he asked me to take him on a drive to go to a place, and um, I told him that I wouldn't because that wasn't the path that I was going to take um, in life. And um, that um, going to the church that night, he had told me that I wasn't his son and that I wasn't like him and that um, he didn't want anything to do with me. And so I just went to church as it was my habit of doing that, and I went that night. And as I sat there, I felt um, so far from him, 
and so desiring to have a father um, in my life. And um, I felt as God was telling me them to go, it felt like he was calling me to the altar. It felt like he was telling me to come to him and that his arms were open and that he would be to me what my earthly father couldn't be. And as I sat there, I just looked around and I thought about all the people in that church and the special relationship I had with them because of Jesus. And that even though I was different than them and I caused them problems, none of them would ever want to turn their back on me. Every one of them loved and believed in me. And um, I went to the altar that day before the invitation, just during the service. And I just remember standing up surrounded by a group of men. I thought they were old. They were y'all's age. You know, they were Dan's age. <laughs> These old men were standing around me and they gave me hugs and they loved me. And I knew that... Um, that God was going to take care of me, that he would be my father, that he would be my dad there. And I'm so thankful that I learned that in a church. And that was where I fell in love uh, with the local church was during that time. I'd been taught it in the Bible, but it was that experience that I had that said, with everything in me, I want to provide that for everybody in the world. And I'm so thankful that my family has it provided uh, through all of you. I'm here at Vision Baptist Church.
Uh, we're going to have you give a word of testimony in a little while if you'd like to be thinking about and praying about how you could brag on the Lord Jesus and what he's done in your life. But we have a bunch of fellows over in China, and we are going to let you get an update from China, I think. Right? So here you go. This is China. <laughs> Hey Vision, I miss seeing you guys today. I hope you guys have a great day and hope you have a great service tonight. Um, asking God to bless you out there. Um, this is awesome and exciting what God's doing here in Dalian. Mark and Natasha are doing a wonderful job. Ben and Crystal are doing an excellent job. Please be praying for these missionaries as they face things that uh, we don't know all the time. So just be praying for them. Um, also be praying that God's going to bring up a new a new group, a new some more men to, to surrender to go here. I'm asking God to bring at least two two guys out of this trip. So um, I ask you to be praying for that. Thank you for being a church that understands and has a heart for world missions. Thank you for allowing people like myself and the other pastor staff, pastoral staff, to uh, go on these trips. And I ask you to just be praying that God just does a work in the hearts of the people around here in Dalian and also these men that are that are looking to see what God's going to do in their lives. Thank you guys. We love you. We miss you. I uh, can't wait to see you guys this Thursday. Yeah. All right, hello, Vision Baptist Church. It's uh, Mark Tolson here. Uh, hello, Vision Baptist Church. It's Mark Tolson right here. And uh, we're in Dolly and Grace Baptist Church. You can see the beautiful city behind me, maybe. I don't know. Depends on if the glare there. Uh, but just want to thank you for uh, having the group come over. We appreciate Pastor Robert being here, uh, Brother John, and the students that came with them. Uh, just uh, thank you for your love and support for our ministry and family here, and we pray that the Lord continue to bless you all. Say hi. hi. Say hi, Ava. Ava, look. Church, miss you guys today, but enjoying being here in Dallas, China, looking at uh, the wonderful things that God is doing. Uh, also, he's done good jobs, so he's the most especially through his work. And um, just keep in prayer for the church over here. I uh, think what's happening. I'm saying, I love you, and I miss you. It's like strawberry fancy with the different twins. What in the world? Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, you ready? Or are you probably shooting right now? Okay, I think it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Vision Baptist Church. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Oh, I don't have anything else to say. You want to say something to Vision? I, yes. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for support. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't have much more. <laughs> What's your name? Hey Vision, this is Jen. Uh, missed seeing y'all uh, this Sunday morning, but it was great being here with Brother Mark and the uh, church here in China. Uh, missed y'all. Uh, looking forward to coming back. Please be in prayer for us as our, we travel back on uh, Tuesday. Hey Vision Baptist Church, this is Noah Wilkerson, uh, Nate, Nate Wilkerson's younger brother. Uh, just wanted to thank y'all and for y'all's support. And uh, we're here in China. It's been a great Sunday services so far and seeing the Lord really work. It's been a great opportunity. Uh, just please uh, continue to pray for me as I continue to seek God's will for my life. Uh, just to, uh, take the gospel to the nations. Uh, we love you and thank you so much. Hey Vision, my name is Jacob Clower. I am a microbiologist from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I came to China on this trip just to uh, search for God's will in my life. Keep me in your prayers as I um, strive to find my place in God's plan for world evangelism. Hey Vision, great to see y'all. 
again. Uh, what? Start again. Now, hurry. Hey, Vision. Great to see you. Great to uh, be here in China. In, in Dali, in China, God is so good. The, the gospels at work here just went to an underground church service and seeing God at work, God moved. There's people that have never heard the gospel, never once heard a clear presentation of the gospel, and uh, excited to be here. Thank you for praying. Love you guys. When are you going to see us? Very soon. Very soon. Next month. Uh, he said that was an underground church, and you might have noticed they're like 25 stories above <laughs> ground, so that's an underground, overground church. Uh, I am making a trip in uh, October to Peru, and I don't know when I'm going to London, but we're, it's on the webpage, huh? September, I'm going to London. I'd like to take you with me, let you see some part of the world. You don't have to worry, you're old enough, you might not get called to be a missionary. I mean, you might. Ty showed you that. But anyway, uh, but anyway, I'd like to have you come and travel with, uh, with me. We'll be organizing uh, Travis Node's church in uh, London. And then in uh, October, it is an uh, annual pastor's, pastor's conference down there. While we were at orientation, we had a time one evening of saying thank you to the Lord. And people told their stories and told what had been going on in their life and told how God had worked and moved in their life. And Austin Teal is here. He's joined the church. He's lived in China for five years. He's married a Chinese girl, so I think he speaks Chinese a little bit. And uh, uh, so he shared a word of testimony. I think it's going to bless your heart. Brother Austin, come on up. Austin is inviting Austin to come up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Um, well, it's always a joy to hear uh, what the Lord is doing in China and how the gospel is advancing and going forward. And so I, I really enjoy seeing that um, and, and listening to them sing and hearing all the, the testimonies of, of what the Lord's doing there. Um, and so about two years ago, a little over two years ago, my wife and I, we got married um, in Longyan, China. Longyan's a, a small city in Southeast China. We got married there um, in April, uh, two years ago. Uh, about one to two million people. So um, we, uh, we got married, and I initially went to China five years previous to that, thinking, I don't know how to, to preach and be a pastor in China, that that's what I want to do, and I'm just going to go and teach English, because everyone says that that's what you have to do in China, and as I teach English, I'll learn Chinese, and I'll figure it out. Well, I got to the point where I was speaking Chinese pretty good, and I met Annie Grace, and so I put the figuring it out part until after we got married, but we got married, and I was thinking, okay, we've been involved in a church here for, um, you know, a few years now, and just really wanting to figure out what it takes to do full-time ministry, and I remembered that about a year before that, I had discovered uh, Jake Talby and Mark Tolson online, and found out that they were in Northeast China doing ministry there, so I reached out to Mark uh, by email, and I just said, hey, I'm here, I'm teaching English, and I want to go, uh, I want to, in China, do what you're doing. How do I do that? And he said, well, brother, if you want to do what I'm doing, you got to go through Alpharetta, Georgia. And so I talked to Annie Grace about it, and um, within about a week or so's time, we made the decision, we're going to come to America. So at that time, it was about May or June of uh, two years ago, and there was a big obstacle standing in our way. Um, I had my, uh, my contract at the school that I was teaching at ending in December, um, and it was about June, but my wife needed to be able to get into the country. She needed a green card. So we did our research, and I had my parents um, here in the States kind of do some research, and we were finding out that for most people to get a green card, um, in our situation, it would take about a year or two. Um, and so we were um, just really praying and, and really striving to fill out all this paperwork and get this green card done so that we could be here and, and get training to go back to China and do the ministry that, that I wanted to do there. Um, and so we start doing all this paperwork. Um, it's a lot of um, having to travel to Guangzhou, uh, which is just this huge city. Uh, it's the third largest city in China. Um, having to fill out paperwork on Annie Grace's behalf, get a lot of her documents in Chinese, then getting them translated, then having the translations notarized, and traveling back and forth to this city, getting medical stuff, uh, medical tests and physicals done. Um, and just different things like that. It was a long, drawn-out process, and we're on the last leg of preparation, and the Lord just blessed and let us pretty much secure it or have most of it done within about five months. 
And so my contract was going to be up in about a month or so, and we were going to, Lord willing, get on a plane and come here um, and be able to get started with training. And we had one last thing to do. We had to go to Guangzhou one more time and let her get um, her physical, which involved immunizations. And so in any immunization process, uh, one thing that they always ask is, are you pregnant? So she gets there, and um, she's going through everything, and they ask her, are you pregnant? She says, no, I'm not pregnant. And so we get through all of that, and we noticed uh, we still had a couple more days in Guangzhou. Um, so we had to wait two days to, to get the results and then turn them into the consulate there. And we're waiting those two days, and Guangzhou is just this huge city. If you're not walking, you're at least having to walk to a subway and, and take it somewhere. And so um, we noticed that Annie Grace was just getting really tired. Um, and we had just been in Guangzhou a few months before and walked all day for three or four days uh, pretty much, uh, just seeing the city and doing different things. But this time, she'd only walked a few hours, and she was exhausted. We get back uh, to Longyan. We still didn't have the results of her, uh, of her green card application, but we were... We were waiting and we were praying, and one day um, I get done with class and I come home and Annie Grace says, Austin, I think I'm pregnant. And I think that I was pregnant when I got my immunizations. And that was one of the most scary moments of my life. We immediately, we called the, the, the uh, place that administered the physical in Guangzhou, uh, asking them, you know, uh, what, what are the ramifications of this? And they're like, you know, there's nothing we can do. You know, we asked, and, and, and she said no. We went to the hospital there in Longyan, and we're asking, you know, what can we do? And in China, the way, the way Chinese people think is so different from the way we think. And she, she walks into the hospital, and she's talking to the doctor, and the doctor says, I recommend that you abort the baby. And, you know, that was absolutely out of the question for us. Um, we're like, well, you know, we just, we're just going to trust in the Lord. We're going to hope that everything turns out okay. And so um, we finally got word that, yes, she had her green card. Uh, they sent it to us in the mail. We were buying tickets to come back. But the whole time we're thinking, what will happen with our baby, our first child? And we, we started to, um, to tell some of our friends that we were getting ready to go back to America and and let them know that, that she was pregnant. And so we're having lunch with someone that worked with me at the school. He was a math teacher there, him and his wife. And we were explaining that, you know, we're getting ready to go back, and, and she's pregnant. And they, without us mentioning anything, they put two and two together, and they said, wait a second, didn't she have to get immunization shots? How did, please tell us that that happened beforehand. And, you know, we, we said, well, no, it, it happened after the fact. And I remember a day after we had lunch with them, uh, Charlie is his English name. Uh, Charlie, we were walking down the road, and, and he pulled me aside, and he said, Austin, we got to talk. Charlie's not a believer. He knows I'm a Christian. Um, he, um, he knows the gospel. I've told it to him. Um, he, he tells me that, you know, God helps those that help himself, help themselves pretty much. And he's... You know, he just doesn't want to have anything to do with Christianity. But um, working together, he, uh, he helped me a lot with my Chinese and stuff. And so we were pretty close. And he pulled me aside and he said, Austin, you and your wife really need to consider aborting this baby. He said, even if the baby survives in her womb, the deformities, the defects, the possibilities, you just don't want to have to deal with it. He said, I'm telling you, you want to get rid of this child and just try again. And I, I was just floored. I mean, here I was, one, a friend of mine, a coworker of mine, someone that, that had really helped me learn the Chinese language is telling me, abort your kid. And so we, 
you know, we, we didn't have anything we could do. The Chinese doctors were telling us to abort. He was telling us to abort, but we knew that we, that was just not an option. And we couldn't get any answers. And a couple more weeks went by. It was time for us to get on the plane to come to America. And we get here, and Annie Grace was dealing with uh, culture shock and jet lag and, and morning sickness and all of those things and just that that first couple of months was just horrible because even the first time we saw a doctor here in America they were like we don't we don't know we, we, we've got to wait a little bit longer before we can tell you if if the baby's okay and so finally around January um, we went in to see the doctor and and the doctor ran some tests and said we're you know 99 percent sure that this baby is going to be okay and we walked out of there just praising the Lord and thanking the Lord for how good and how great he is. And many of you have seen him because his name's Abraham, and he's in the nursery right now. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, he's got nothing wrong with him. I mean, he eats like a horse. Um, he's growing just great and fine. He has no kind of sickness or disease or deformity or anything. And though the world was telling us, you've got to get rid of him, the Lord was good. And the Lord protected and provided. And we're here, and we're serving, and we're in just great anticipation to get on the deputation trail and to get back to China to, to tell everyone about how great this God is. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me again. We'll uh, sing together. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness, I'll look to Him who hears me. My delight and my reward, everlasting, never failing, my Redeemer, my God. Find rest, my soul, in God alone, amid the world's temptations. When evil seeks to take a hold, I'll cling to my salvation. Though riches come and riches go, don't set your heart upon them. The fields of hope in which I sow are harvested in heaven. Oh, praise Him, hallelujah, my delight and my reward, everlasting, never failing, my Redeemer. My God, I'll set my gaze on God alone and trust in Him completely. With every day, pour out my soul, and He will prove His mercy. Though life is but a fleeting breath, a sigh too brief to measure. My King has crushed the curse of death, and I am His forever. Oh, praise Him, hallelujah, my delight and my reward. Everlasting, never failing, my Redeemer, my God. Thank you very much. You can have a seat. How many of you have enjoyed it so far? Say amen. amen. I hope you have. And I hope you'll pray for all these different people. Well, our preacher is Dr. Nate Francis. <laughs> now, where's your Bible? <laughs> I mean, you just think you own the pulpit. No. I just felt like it'd be weird to be singing there, holding my Bible. I was the only one up there. But anyway, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like this... Um, Trent was, he approached me and was talking to me and said the whole idea for the service was to take a moment to sing the different songs and have the different testimonies to talk about um, why we praise God and how we can glory in Him and take a moment to just really think about what we say when we praise Him and how we feel about 
um, praising him and glorifying him. I don't know about you guys, but I think this service has already blessed my heart a lot, getting to see people come up here, give their testimonies to see the way that God's worked in their life, think of the way that God's worked in my life, and hear these different songs praising him and glorifying him. Well, the song that's going to be um, coming up here in a moment of a special is Oh Glorious Day. And the chorus goes, Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. And that, um, Trent told me to listen to the song and say, like, I don't know, listen to it. See if like, it touches your heart, if like, you like it when you hear it. I was like, I did, it was an incredible song. Hearing it and listening to what the lyrics really, really meant. And it was written like in 1911 or 1912, like way forever ago by a fella. But we're going to sing it here again today, like 105 years later or something. Why did it last that long? Why is it, was it a glorious day then? Why was it a glorious day today? And I want to take a moment to look at a passage of Scripture and see why Jesus is coming is really the most glorious day. But I want to go ahead and um, bow our heads in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for giving us this opportunity to worship you and to really think about the way you work in our lives and how much you truly love us. And I pray that you would be with me, Lord, as I um, give this message, that you'd help me to explain it clearly. And I pray you work in the hearts of me and the people here that, as it is explained, Lord, that we not only get a better understanding of the passage, but we get an understanding so that we really think about how we can praise you and glorify you in what we do, Lord. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. And so the passage we're going to be in is John chapter 14, and it's verses uh, 1 through 4, and I'll go ahead and read it. And it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Now, Jesus is saying here, what well, he was given a um, passage before this, he was um, telling that he's going to go to the cross, he's going to die, he's gonna, he was um, saying how Judas is going to betray him, he was saying how Peter was going to deny him, he's given all these really bad things, uh, prophecies of things that aren't really good, and he's thinking these guys are really, really discouraged. Like, I'm not, I didn't tell them anything good, they're really, they're really upset, they're really depressed about all these messages, so he's like, he's like, hold up you guys, this is, there's hard stuff that's coming, but what's coming later way outshadows what's going to happen. And he says, in the world... He says, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus knew that we had troubles in our life. He knew the disciples had troubles with what they were doing. We just had several people come up. with was uh, Kelly with um, her illness. I had Trent with his parents. And um, Austin with the struggles with his son. And everybody has all kinds of troubles. You can have troubles with your job, with your school, with whatever's going on. People have trouble. That's kind of an understood thing for everybody different things that we go through, different things that we struggle with, and Jesus understood that. Let not your heart in trouble. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He didn't go through and explain the different troubles. He didn't address each one individually because it doesn't have to be individual. He doesn't have to say, you believe in God and you believe in me so that you feel better about um, your family and about your job, but if maybe you're being treated poorly by your family and people are hurting you or maybe people are making fun of you, then I can't help you there. I'm sorry, that's out of my control. There's not ever any kind of trouble somewhere where Jesus can't help us. Believing in God is universal. It's all one big thing that catches it. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. The disciples are discouraged. We can be discouraged for any number of reasons. But believing in God is a cure to that trouble. We all have troubles in our lives, but if we can trust in God, we believe in what Jesus says, then we can, have, we can have calm from the troubles that are in our hearts. And he goes on to, um, in the passage to explain just one thing that I think is one of the coolest examples of being able to rejoice in what God does for us. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus Christ, think about it. We're sinners, obviously. The Bible says that over and over and over again. We have troubles. We're low. We're not anything important at all. I mean, what? Kelly even said it, that there's ways that God was good to her that she couldn't have ever expected. What did we do to earn that? How good were we to God? The Bible says that we love God because he first loved us. We didn't do anything to earn it. We don't deserve any of his love. But he says that he goes to prepare a place for us. That in his house, in his father's house, are many mansions. Like, I don't know what you guys 
think of when you think of a mansion, but usually it's really big and it's really pretty and it's got like a jacuzzi or something. It's really, really, really nice. It's a good house. And there's a and the Jesus is saying that God has that in heaven and he's going to prepare a place specifically for me, specifically for everybody who's believed in him. He's gone to make a place that's ready for us. And he says, if he wasn't going to do it, he would have told us. He would have said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm sorry, you guys. It's hard to be you. But he says, no, I am doing this. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it could be a trailer park that Jesus made for me. I grew up in a trailer park. They're not that bad. But if Jesus is going to be there, it could be the worst trailer park, and it'd still be incredible. It could be the, the worst place. But with Jesus there, it would be completely worth it. That's all that we need is Jesus, but he's still better than that. Mansions of glory. I don't like, um, you read in the scripture in Revelation, streets of gold, mansions. I remember growing up and um, they used to have these pictures in my, in my school of what uh, they imagined heaven to look like. But it was, I think they called it the New Jerusalem. It was this really big cube. And I haven't quite gotten to Revelation yet in my Bible reading, so I'm not sure if that's biblical. But they had the throne of God right there in the middle and these mansions all around it. But it was bright. God was in the center of it. There was light coming out of it. It was supposed to be the most beautiful place in the entire universe. But what makes it so special is that God's in the center of it. Jesus goes to prepare a place for us because he loves us so much. In this world, we have trouble. But Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Because we believe in him, he's gone to prepare a place for us. And he says in verse 3, probably one of the best parts of the whole thing, says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He guarantees it. Jesus Christ came. The Course says, living he loved me. Jesus Christ loved us so much that dying he saved me. He paid the price for our sins that we don't deserve. We don't deserve to have our sin debt paid. We deserve to spend eternity in hell. But he came and he died for us on the cross. Buried, he carried our sins far away. No more is there any sin paid on, on us. He says that in uh, 2 Corinthians, that we were made the righteousness of God in him. Not only is our sin gone, but we've been made righteous. So he's forgiven us of all of our sins and made us righteous in the sight of God. Rising, he justified freely forever. And one day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. And that is probably, I get like goosebumps just thinking about it. He's coming back. He really is coming back. He says, he says that where I am, there he may be also. I will come again. And whither I go, the way ye know. We is not just some big mystery. God's not some distant thing that we don't know about. He's not somebody that meant that we sing these songs to we don't really understand. I mean, we say it because everybody else does. We say it because our parents do. It's not like that. We don't have to separate ourselves from worshiping God, from glorying in him and singing these praises to him. We can really put our heart in it because he was really there. He really loved us. He loved us so much that he went he died, he rose again, and he's promising to come again. He will not leave us here on our own. We have a hope that one day Jesus Christ is returning. And if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what does. Because there's sometimes I get really discouraged, and sometimes it's like, I wish I could go right now. I remember when I first got saved, I was like eight years old, a poor counselor. I was at the Wilds camp, and he was the one that um, led me to the Lord when I had gotten up uh, during the invitation. And I, was, I didn't make any sense. I was like, I can't believe he understood what I was saying. But I was walking back to the cabin after we had, I had um, prayed and accepted Jesus to be my Savior. I was like talking to him. And I said like, so you know, if I died right now, I'd get to go to heaven, right? It's like, yeah, like you're saved. You know, you're going to go to heaven. So, like, so if I took that knife, I, was, I think it was a turkey knife. I don't, I remembered it was in my mom's kitchen. It was huge. It was like that long and had two ends on the end of it and it was serrated. I think it was a turkey knife. I still don't know to this day, but I was explaining it to him. I was like describing, it's like, it's that really long knife. It's really sharp and it's got two points on the end. Like if I stab myself with it and I died, I'd go to heaven. He's like, yeah, yeah, you'd go to heaven. Don't do that. But I was like, but I don't want to do that because Jesus wants me to live for him because he loves me. And because he saved me, I want to live for him. Right. And he's like, yeah, buddy, that's right. You're right. That's exactly right. So I, that poor guy gave him the hard time, but he's exactly right. 
We could die right now and spend eternity in heaven for him. But we don't have to. He wants us to live for him today. He wants us to praise him. He's given us the promise. He's coming back. Right now, we can praise him, we can glorify him, and we can thank him for what he's done. And I want to ask you guys, when they come up and they do the special, and they sing about it, really think about what the words say. Trent's going to come up and give the offering. And we got today, the whole service is geared towards praising God. And I want to ask you guys, really think about what God is doing for us. Really think about how much he's done in your life, because he's coming back. He's coming back for you to take you home with him for eternity. Because he loves you so much. Think about ways that you can praise him throughout the rest of the service and this evening. Thank you. Amen. Men are preparing to receive the offering, and uh, we have a group that will come up here to sing at this time, and um, I will pray. I'll admit there may be days that I want to introduce Nate to Jesus, um, but I am thankful for his excitement about the things of the Lord, and what a wonderful truth we should be able to rejoice in uh, today. Also learn that there's two songs called Glorious Day, and you're going to learn that as well here in a moment. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for what we have heard from your word uh, just now uh, through uh, the servant Nate. Lord, thank you for preparing a place for us and how excited we should be when we hear that you are coming again for us. Lord, you did not leave us um, comfortless. You sent the Spirit, and we are looking forward to that day, and we make our decisions of life based upon the fact that we know that you will return for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Well, we can all move to a trailer park <laughs> in heaven and enjoy that. Amen. I want to see if anybody has a word of testimony real quickly before we have a, a report from the World Evangelism Cabinet. So if you'd like to share a word of testimony, something God's done in your life, uh, just like the other people have, you got a chance here for two or three of you. Does anybody want to say a word? Yes, thank you. It's kind of dark over there from here, y'all. You're setting it, your lovers of darkness over there. Nope. A couple weeks ago, I was really worried about my salvation, and um, I went through a lot in a couple months, a few short months, actually. And I went to my parents one Friday night. Um, it was the weekend of the 28th, um, a few months after my 15th birthday, and um, they pointed me to the Bible. And I want to thank the Lord for parents who point you to the Bible. And I read the eternal security verses, and I was kind of reassured, but I was still doubting, and then Sunday you talked about the two kingdoms and which one you're a part of, and once you mentioned the kingdom of um, the devil, it was like in my heart, I'm still a part of that kingdom, and then at the end, I, um, in my heart, some I just felt like God really wanted me to go to the back and just talk to my dad about it all, so I did, and he asked me, he said, do you believe in Jesus? I said, yes. He said, do you believe Jesus is God? I said, yes. He said, do you believe he died on the cross for you? I said, yes. He said, there's one thing you don't, you haven't done. I said, what? He said, you haven't accepted him. You haven't asked him into your heart, and that's what you need to do. If you've done that, do you remember it? I said, I never remember ever asking him into my heart. And he said, then do it. So me and him prayed together. And I want to thank the Lord for my dad because he's always been proud of me no matter what I've done. Amen. And I'm a proud sister of my little brothers and my big brothers and my older sister. And I thank the Lord for my family because without it, I don't know who I'd be right now. So thank you. And thanks, Visit Baptist Church, for um, putting a lot into me and being an effort and always standing behind me and my family. I think a testimony about getting saved deserves a round of applause myself. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, okay. Here. So if it's on. So this one is just an opportunity to brag on the Lord Jesus Christ. I had the opportunity to talk about my father when he had um, he smoldered in myeloma, and he went into treatment and became myeloma. So basically, but um, just to realize how great of a God that we do serve is that uh, the doctors are saying that the treatment for him is going so well that he should be the poster child for the treatment. He's up. He's moving. He's still eating. He's watching comedy to laugh. Uh, to keep himself feeling better. His white cell count is pretty much zero, so once he starts to build back up, he'll be able to come home and get his immunity. He'll be locked in a basement for about four to six weeks because the cold could kill him because he has no immune system. But I just wanted to give the opportunity to say thank you. I know there was a lot of prayers, and he was in Fox, and so it was a blessing to me that he's doing pretty incredibly well. So I just want to Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. You're a blessing to us too. All right, anybody else? Five, four, three. Two, one. I have the great World Evangelism Cabinet Director Lamar White, and he is coming up here to give you an update on the continent of Africa. How you doing? Uh, I have Africa, Sub-Sahara, right? Uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about Kenya. Now, as you know, we have two. Well, one missionary there, uh, Sturwalt, uh, and uh, Josh Wormley is planning on being being there hopefully this time, this year sometime. I ask you to pray for them because there's a lot of unrest going on right now, so much that the Sturwalts are coming back here in a couple months, for a couple months, and Josh has put off his uh, leave time until about the time they go back. So I just ask you to pray for that country and pray for them also because we, over here, we don't really, I guess, get a lot of what these missionaries go through in these other countries. You know, they're, sometimes they're having to hide to have church. You know, the, the locals probably don't want them there anyway, you know, because they are considered an outsider. Uh, we go through the slides. Uh, there's the flag. 
And if we go through the next slide there, uh, this is kind of the religions broken up. They can see uh, Protestant is 47%, uh, 11% Muslim, 23% uh, Catholic, uh, other 16%. Then you have 1.6% of traditional African beliefs. And under the 47.4%, I know it says Christian, but as uh, I did some studying, that could not necessarily mean Bible-believing Christian. That's the way it stated on the, my research was something they believed in other than, you know, Muslim, Catholic, and the, I guess, the local beliefs. Uh, we go to the next one. This is a population, and as you can see, starting at the bottom at 2010, this is, it started at 40 million, then 2015 it jumped to, of course that is five years, so that's a lot of folks. It's <laughs> 46 million, there was a lot of babies. <laughs> In 2016, you know, it went up 47. In 2017, right now it's 40, 48. So as you can see, that's right at or over a million people of each year being born. That's a million people more each year that probably won't have the chance to hear the, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, that's, that's the reason missionaries are so important. And to go out here and reach them to the fact, for, take this in consideration, there's almost 40, eight million and a half people there, there's two missionaries. That's just in Kenya. So how in the world would they be able to reach all those people? I don't think they'd be able to without help. And that's more missionaries. And if you go the last uh, slide, that population number there is kinda, I, I was on a whole bunch of different sites trying to find information, so I would disregard that because that's as you can see, that's 33 million. The other one was 48 million. I'm not a math whiz, but that ain't right. <laughs> 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 the capital is uh, Nairobi, I believe. And it's uh, 2.8 million. And the area, you know, of just the uh, the capital is uh, 2,000, two, 200,000. And 24,000, sorry, I'm nervous. 224,081 square miles. And that's, that's a pretty big little section there. Their language is English, Squahili, and numerous indigenous languages. As, and under religion, it's Protestant, Roman Catholic, indigenous beliefs, and Muslim. Currency is uh, Kenya shilling, I believe. Life expectancy is 46 years old. I mean, that's, that's not that old. I just turned 42, so if I was there, I had four more years. <laughs> I like to have a few more, you know? And literacy, literacy percent is 85%. That's what I found uh, intriguing is 85% of the people of the population can read. So that means if we have people to tell them about Jesus Christ, they'll be able to read and understand and get the Bible. I want to thank you all. Well, I hope you will pray for Kenya and pray for the guys over there. And uh, you better pray that Latasha doesn't take him up on the Kenyan life expectancy <laughs> and take him out in about four or five more years. Uh, I love that guy and his family. They're my Sunday school class, so I know them pretty good. Thank you all for being here today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it was a blessing to you. Uh, now you're on vacation. You're not supposed to skip services, but you're skipping because we just swapped them around. I told uh, Trent, I feel so bad, I might go find a church to go to. All right. Thank you all for being here. Let's stand together and shake hands with each other. We're dismissed. <laughs>